we'll take a look at the text of the Ten Pronouncements at Sinai. Here are the blue books over here. People have blue books, and we'll be able to study it together. Oh, I have one here. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, which starts on page 407. I just want to start with a comment on the title here. You probably have heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, it ain't true. There aren't Ten Commandments. If you count the number of commandments in this passage, it's either 14 or 15, depending upon how you count. And the first sentence might not be a commandment at all, according to some commentators. Nowhere in classical Jewish sources is it called Ten Commandments. Nowhere. In the Torah itself, it's called Aseris Hadvarim, the Ten Sayings. In rabbinic literature, it's called Aseris Adibros, which would be the Ten Pronouncements. But nowhere is it called the Ten Commandments. Okay, the art school writes the Ten Commandments because due to Bible Christianity, that became the title everybody knows. That was even a famous movie called the So. Okay. But it just, it's, just, it's just not correct. The right thing to say is the Ten Pronouncements at Sinai. Um, and as you can imagine, the sources on this are bottomless, so I'm just skimming off the surface for an hour, a few, a few, a few ideas um, out of what could take a lifetime. So on page 107, the very first statement, I am Hashem your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. So, in simple terms, that's the introduction. After that come commandments, things that you should do. Rabbi Yudha Levi asked a very fundamental question here. I want to ask it and see what you think, see what you think about it. You're sort of setting the, fra the framework, you're setting the foundation, and then on the basis of that foundation, God's going to say to the Jewish people, here's what I want you to do. If we were writing the book, we might have thought of an alternative framework or other alternative frameworks. What could be the starting point for then going on to issue commandments? <clears throat> one that he suggested is how about I am Hashem your God who created the universe that's pretty impressive and if it's the foundation for then giving commandments seems to be a pretty authoritative uh, foundation creating the universe so there are two questions here that I would like to hear what you think about. One is, could you have any explanation for why the Torah chose I took you out of Egypt over I, commanded the I created the universe? And also, maybe there are other possible foundations that you could think of, which we could ask why they weren't used. What, what strikes you here? What, uh, what impresses you here? What difference would it make if it had said, I'm the one who created the universe? Yeah. Well, um, taking, taking us out of the land of Egypt is something Hashem did specifically for us. Yes, that's something he did specifically for us. If it had said, I created the universe, 
that wouldn't be specifically for us. Okay. So now, what follows in the rest of it that would make a difference, whether he makes reference to something he did specifically for us, whether he makes reference to creating the universe. Well, one of the commandments in the list is the commandment of Shabbos. What's the status of the commandment of Shabbos? Does it apply to all people or only to the Jewish people? The answer is only to the Jewish people. That commandment is not given to anybody else. So you can imagine someone who has a critical mind, let's say from Brooklyn, if it had said, I created the universe, say, okay, you created the universe, I'm listening, I'm listening, the universe. Well, don't steal. Gotcha, right? No one should, no one should steal, no one. Don't kill innocent people. Right, no one should do that. I hear that. Don't take God's name in vain. Right, 100%. No one should do that. Thank you very much. And then it says, and keep Shabbos. Wait a second. Who are you talking to? You're only talking to the Jewish people? But if the foundation is you created the universe, you created the Chinese also. So why would you start from something that all people have in common, that you created the universe we all live in, and then give an instruction that applies only to the Jewish people? So that would be one strike against using creation of the universe as the foundation because it wouldn't fit one of the details that comes later. That's one possibility. Uh, what else? Anything else strike you? Why well, would say, I took you out of Egypt rather than I created the universe? Okay, to remind us specifically what he saved us from, rather than creating the universe. Try it on for size. Imagine you're there. Imagine you're here. I created the universe, and then and it goes on. Well, let me, let me ask it to you this way. How do you think different people would respond to, I created the universe? Would everybody respond the same way? Certainly not. I think there are some people who would fall asleep. Really? Once upon a time, you what? You created the universe? How would you relate to that? I mean, it's sort of awesome, but it's a very deep philosophical idea. There are a lot of people who don't think that way. How many people do you know who are really interested in the Big Bang? That's where the universe came from. A lot of people say, so? So what? I mean, I'm living in it. I have a life. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm much more interested in how I can get a raise at my job than I am in where the universe came from. How many people would you reach if you used that foundation and said, here it is. This is the foundation. Now, because of this, here are my instructions. Some people just aren't going to relate. They aren't going to relate. You say, listen, you were slaves in Egypt a decade ago, five, five, five uh, months ago, you were slaves. They all remember that. They all know how bitter it was. They all are rejoicing in the fact that they, 50 days ago, left Egypt. That's something that they're all going to relate to. They're all going to identify with. So it seems like the Torah is using a foundation that speaks to them as people where they are. Now, if that's the way this revelation at Sinai starts, then that must be very important. We have to understand that the Torah is written so that it will relate to people where they are. That might then explain certain features of the way the text expresses itself which otherwise might be difficult to understand. For example, 
there are many physical descriptions of God and many anthropomorphic descriptions of God. God's eyes, God's head, God's feet, God's passions, loving some things, hating other things. These are all anthropomorphic descriptions of God. Our official philosophy says that they're not literally true. So then why are they written? Well, for a lot of people, if you don't use this vocabulary, they won't be with you. They won't be able to relate to what you're saying. So the Torah uses this vocabulary in order to relate to you. And that means that it can't be just discarded. Oh, well, someday I'll learn the real philosophy and learn that this is all just fluff, just nonsense. No, it's not nonsense. It creates a real relationship, which isn't complete. It creates an impression, which isn't finished. But it's not going to be discarded. It's going to be incorporated into a larger context. It's a little bit like, a little bit like learning that the table that you're sitting at is almost all empty space. You know that because you know what an atom is like. It's got a nucleus, and it has used to have electrons cycling around. Now they're only purple fuzz until you look at them. And there's a lot of empty space there, gigantic amount of empty space. That was a big surprise. So then you think, but then what about the table? Where's the empty space? How come it resists my hand like that? OK, there are electromagnetic forces, and there are structures and lattices and so forth and so on. Now you have to have two things in your head. It's solid, certainly is solid, and it's almost all empty space. They're both true. They're both true. It isn't as if, really, the, the table is a gas and you didn't know it. No, it's a solid. But you don't know what a solid is. A solid is the organization of certain things in a framework of almost all empty space. Almost never do you think, oh boy, there's a lot of empty space here. Because you don't need it. You don't use that idea. But it's the truth. So there's a difference between how you intuitively deal with the world and the words you use and the concepts you use, and then the official philosophy, which you learned in physics and forgot since then, that it's really all, almost all empty space. So there are different levels on which information impinges on you. You relate to the information. Here, Kodesh Baruch wrote, dictated a book. This book was word for word. Others are either word for word or inspired. And they all communicate ideas, all of which we are supposed to live with. Only we'll live with them on different levels, depending upon our education and our sophistication. At any rate, saying that he took us out of Egypt is something that everybody can understand, everybody can relate to. It means that, number one, the creator knows what's going on. Number two, the creator acts in the world, hasn't abandoned the world. This is not deism, where he creates the world and goes on vacation. Number three, he has certain standards for the world, certain standards for what should be done, what shouldn't be done. He has a plan for the world. The Jews were taken out of Egypt in order to receive the Torah, and that was a plan, a, a, a linchpin on which the world stands. Without that, the world wouldn't have any meaning or any purpose. That gives you a picture of the way of which the Creator relates to the world. And that picture is extremely important. OK, what do you got so far? OK, now I want you to take a look on page 411. That's from the sublime to the, now to the particular. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you work and accomplish all your work. The seventh day is Shabbos to Hashem, your God, you shall not do any work. Now in the English you have work, work, work. And you would be forgiven if you thought that in the Hebrew it must be the same word three times, but it isn't. It's not the same word, and it's not the same concept. One word is ta'avod and avodah. That means work. That sort of connotes stress, using up energy, sweating, being tired, aching muscles. It's work. But then there's a word here, malacha. 
should do all of your malacha. And with the prohibition on Shabbos is don't do malacha, not don't do work. What is malacha? Roughly, malacha means a, an action which is physically creative, done intentionally, and um, is, is done for a purpose, done for, it's useful. It changes the physical world in some, in some significant way, and it's done to achieve a purpose, and it's done intentionally. It's not done by accident. It requires uh, attention at, in order to be accomplished. Now, here's a scenario that worked itself out in the United States in the beginning of the 20th century. Thousands of times, the Jew comes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I know it says in the Torah not to do work because he read the English. He says, don't do any work on Shabbos. But Rabbi, striking a match isn't work. It's easy. I don't get tired when I strike matches. Surely, when the Torah said don't do work, didn't mean that I can't strike a match. That's not work. The correct answer is, you're confusing avodah with malacha. What's prohibited on Shabbos is not avodah, which is work. What's prohibited on Shabbos is malacha. Let's see. When you strike a match, is there a significant physical change? Yeah, before there was no fire, now there's fire. Light and heat. And is it something which it, pr it produces a new phenomenon, and it doesn't happen by accident. People, I, I can't imagine the person's just sort of not paying attention to what he's doing and striking a match. It requires attention and intention to strike a match. So is it a malacha? Oh, yes, it is. And once you know that the Torah prohibits malacha, then you see that aching muscles isn't part of it. So it's not relevant. So that's what the Torah prohibits on Shabbos, roughly. It's a very sophisticated account, there's lots of details, but that's the rough, the rough idea. Now, what does the word Shabbos mean? Okay, one thought is rest. No, nope, it's not correct. What else? What else could Shabbos mean? Say again? Okay. You avoided all the other false, false rules. Shabbos means cessation, stopping doing something. Shabbos is the seventh day of the week, right? It's very important. It's built into the word Shabbos that you were doing something before that you are now stopping. Let me point out to you that in uh, non-Jewish calendars, the first day of the week is Sunday. And Sunday is celebrated as the biblical Sabbath in certain religions. There's a problem there. Because according to the word Shabbos, you can't start the week with Shabbos. You can't start a sequence of activity by stopping. Stopping requires something that happened before. In modern Hebrew, the word for a strike is a shvita. Same word. Of course, that assumes that beforehand the workers were working, which could be checked out. But that's, that's what's being told here is that on Shabbos, that's a cessation of this kind of activity. Now, the Torah goes on. You shall not do any malacha, kadesh. You, your son, your daughter, your male slave, your female slave, your animal, and your convert within your gates. How does this list strike you? Any questions arise in your mind when you look at this list of the ones who should keep Shabbos? Okay, first of all, what are animals doing there? Animals have to keep Shabbos? Certainly not. Animals have no commandments. Notice, yeah? Why the slave? Why the slave? Meaning, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't hear you. Why are they there? Meaning, what? That does, 
you as a Jew will keep Shabbos, but they shouldn't be required to keep Shabbos? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So therefore, this what kind of slave is this? If he's a Jewish slave, then he will have to keep Shabbos. So this has got to be what's called an Evet a non-Jewish slave, and non-Jewish slaves have to keep Shabbos also. That's true, they do. And that, uh, you're right to point it out. It might not have been obvious, since he isn't Jewish. The truth is, even a non-Jewish slave is 98% Jewish. That's, a, that's another story that we can go into another time, but it was, it was very good to point it out. What else, what else bothers you here, should bother you here? Okay, we, we spoke about animals, right? Why is that animals on the list? We'll get, I'm not answering it. I'm just pointing. Uh, what else? What else? Yeah. I just say like the servant, the animal, all those things belong to him. They're under his jurisdiction. He, he runs them. He makes them move. So when he benefits from their work on Shabbos, it's as if he's working himself. So therefore, they're included in the list. Okay. This is very good. I usually get to this 10 minutes from now, and I think you did very well. What, uh, let's ask. This is you and what? What is it a list of? What he says is you and the things that are under your control, things that are under your responsibility, and you, he's pointing out you shouldn't have benefit. We'll talk about that. Of course, there's one there that is, doesn't really fit, fit, fit that, that description. Which one? The convert. Right. Convert is an independent Jew, and depending on what you mean by convert. Okay. Is anybody missing from the list? How about your wife? How about your wife? Oh, my. She controls herself. <laughs> okay, you know a lot. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. What we said now already answered that. Because we said it's a list of you and those who are under your control. They are your responsibility. Rashi says here, your children, son and daughter, minors, not adults, boys below 13 and girls below 12. If Rashi says that the children are minors, he implies that once they become adults, then they have their own responsibility. If they have their own responsibility, who says the Y-O-U at the beginning is referring to men. Oh, why did you make that assumption? A little male chauvinism sort of creeping out from under the blanket. Right? The Y-O-U refers to every adult Jew, male or female. That's why the wife isn't there. Indeed, if a woman's married, she's, a, she's part of the U also. She is there. She's there under the Y-O-U. Okay, so now the question is, um, what's the convert doing there? And the order that the convert comes to the, uh, comes to the end, even after the animal. And now the answer is what? what you want to say something? The answer is what, is what he said. The animal, of course, has no requirement to keep Shabbos. Uprooting, growing uh, plant life from, from, the, from its source of nourishment is forbidden on Shabbos, but the, cow, the cows can graze. They can eat the grass and, rip and, and pull it out of the ground. There's no problem with that. But the animal shouldn't do something for you on Shabbos. For example, threshing wheat used to be done. They take a pole stuck in the ground, pile up the wheat around the pole, take a cow, put a rope around its neck. The other end is tied loosely to the pole. And the cow would walk around the pole and pull and step on the grain, and that's how the grain was threshed. I was here in 1967, right after the 67 war, and I saw this in the Golan Heights, which at those times was Syria. I saw it being done. From 2,000 years ago, that's how they were living. So now, for you to set up the cow that the cow should thresh for you on Shabbos, that you can't do. That's what it's telling you you can't do. You can't have benefit from his doing that. The same thing is true, according to one understanding, when it talks about the convert. The word in Hebrew is ger, and has two applications. A ger is, means someone who's living in a place, but living there 
as an added to the local population. And there are two types of gear. A non-Jew who commits himself to keep the Jewish laws for non-Jews. The Torah is a Torah for everyone in the world. And it has the laws that non-Jews should keep. And he commits himself to do that. He's a welcome neighbor. He lives among Jews and is respected. If he's in trouble, we have to, we have to save him and, and, and make sure that he prospers. And here it is, July 16th. There's a heat wave. And uh, the, this Ger, Ger Toshav is called, comes out in the morning and he sees that his neighbors, the Jew, the neighbors, petunias are wilting. And he's there with his hose watering his flowers. And he says to the Jew, I water my flowers. Shall I water your wilting petunias also so they won't die? And the Jew has to say, no, thank you. No, thank you. He doesn't have to keep Shabbos. He's not a Jew. But he shouldn't do something for us on Shabbos. I have to try to avoid his doing that. The other possibility is that he's a real convert. Now, if he's a real convert, what's he doing in the list of my responsibilities? And the Rahman says something very interesting here. When you look at the laws of the Torah, there are a number of laws where there's a statement that all Jews have to keep it, and there's a special statement that um, we have to be concerned about converts in addition to the fact that we have to keep it. For example, don't hurt people with words. Don't hurt, don't hurt people with words. It said generally, a Jew shouldn't hurt any other Jew with words. And then it said again, and a Jew shouldn't hurt a convert with words. Why? Because they're more vulnerable. Because there's more that can, that can hurt them. If someone reminds them of their background and said, you know, who are you? You came from Minnesota. You know, why well, don't I have to pay attention to you? That would be terribly hurtful. So we have a double prohibition against hurting uh, converts. Same thing is true with Shabbos. Shabbos is the one mitzvah in the Torah that a non-Jew should not do. All the other ones, if a non-Jew does them voluntarily, we'll get, we'll get a reward for it. Shabbos is something that's reserved only for the Jewish people. So, when he becomes finally a Jew, and Shabbos is tough. There are a lot of difficult laws, and uh, for a person who's used to a normal schedule, it's a tremendous disruption of his normal schedule. So, a Jew has to have a care for a convert for the fact to enable him to understand what needs to be done on Shabbos and be able to do it in a, in a way that's, uh, that's productive for him. So it's an extra responsibility that we have. So the list is really a list of an adult Jew and all those who the adult Jew was responsible for. And it's an order of severity of responsibility. Your first responsibility is your children. That's the most important responsibility that you have. After that are your servants who are under your direction and control. After that are your animals who you own, but aren't human. And after that, there's the two different types of gear who have, for whom you have some responsibility, and that's what the list is a list of here. That when the Torah is telling you to keep it, it means, and again, when, when it says you and them, what it's saying is that part of your keeping Shabbos is taking responsibility for them in these ways. It's not just some, something external that you have to do, but it's an expression of your commitment to Shabbos that you take, take care for their needs in terms of what they need to be able to do and not to do on Shabbos. Okay? That's the, that's the, that's the idea here. Now, at the end it says, verse 11, for in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all therein, and he ceased on the seventh day, um, even though the verb in Hebrew can be translated as rest, the word rest in Hebrew and in English can also mean simply to cease. Um, it was the 16th hole of the 18th hole uh, golf, golf course, and um, it was a par three. He hit the with the first shot into the middle of the concourse. And the second one with an iron, he hit it onto the green, and it came to rest three inches from the cup. 
That could happen, right? Are we saying that the golf ball is relaxing, sipping a martini, recovering its strength from its, from its efforts? No, came to rest means it stops moving, that's all. All the rest of it, if you're a human being and you've been exerting yourself and then you stop moving, then you will regain your strength and so forth and so on. But the word rest doesn't mean that. Rest just means stopping moving. So the Kodesh Baruch Hu stopped doing what he was doing on the six days. Okay. So now, what is the Torah telling me? You shouldn't do any physically creative work because God created the world six days and on the seventh day, he stopped doing that. I think we should take a step back and say, so what? He did that, so we should do this? Why? What is there in our relationship or in the nature of our existence that would make a natural bridge between he does and you do? Do we have that much in common? that it makes it natural to say, well, if he does it, you should do it. I mean, he's infinite and we're finite. He's creator and we are created. He's even beyond spirituality, let alone physicality. Spirituality is something he created. And, and we are physical and have a spiritual element. And then it says, and he did, so you should do? And the truth is that this is a general theme. The, the, the Talmud tells us, just as he is gracious, so you should be gracious. Just as he is merciful, so you should be merciful. There are verses that say, just as he is holy, so you should be holy. Ben Yonah, in a letter, says something, Omoshaki, just as he creates worlds, so you too should create worlds. His whole philosophy here. As he is, so you should also. Well, as you've probably heard, there's a verse wrongly translated as he created us in his image. The word Hebrew doesn't mean image. It has no visual connotations. The word selim doesn't mean that. But he created us with something in common with him. That means that although, in, in so to speak, his essence, he's infinitely removed from us, he created an analogy. He puts something relevant to himself into us. There is a bridge. And this concept is a real general concept that we are capable of acquiring and developing in ourselves <laughs> godly characteristics. And one of the themes of what we're supposed to do with our lives is to do that. So now, he um, created the world in six days and ceased that creative activity on the seventh day. We engage in physically creative activity all week long, on the seventh day, we should not engage in that type of physically creative activity. So there is a parallel there. After all, what was he creating? He's creating the universe, a large portion of which is, is physical, not all of it is, but it's, it's physical. And our creativity, uh, in, in physical terms, should come to a ceasing point on Shabbos. We shouldn't do it anymore. Do you have, do you have a question? No, okay. Well, I thought I'd say hand, I thought I'd hand it go up. So, um, the question is what's expressed by the idea of not performing any physically creative activity. I want to insert a modern idea here. From my general knowledge, I think it's, it's relevant, and it will, I think, connect to some co concepts that you have. I'm just saying that this is my own, my own idea. We live in a physical world, and a great deal of our ability to survive and be productive depends upon our, upon our controlling that physical world. The more control we have, the more we can remake the environment in our image so as to make it more convenient for ourselves. One, mess, one lesson in the cessation of doing malach on Shabbos is, for 24 hours, you have to mold yourself to it. You can't mold it in your image. You can't do that. Um, you're dining Friday night by candlelight. 
and you're going to, at the end of the meal, you're on a bench. You're having a wonderful discussion, and you're singing songs, and the candles are getting lower and lower. In 20 minutes, it's going to be dark. We better bench right away, because we've got to see the words on the page. And when the candles go out, what do you mean the candles go out? Light more candles. No, you can't do that. We have to change the activity of our meal to fit the candles. We can't change the candles to do that because we can't re- remake the physical environment. I think people who are interested in ecology might find a certain inspiration here. One of the messages of ecology is that the physical environment is not infinitely plastic. You can't remake it without, without boundary because ultimately you'll destroy it. There can be discussions as what counts as real danger and what counts as real destruction. I think there's a lot of misinformation about that. But the general idea is certainly correct. It is possible to, re- to destroy the world. So a 24-hour period where you fit yourself into it rather than remaking it to fit you might have a certain spiritual benefit. That's part of what's going on when you give up doing malacha on Shabbos. Now, one of the commandments here at the end, one that's fairly familiar, I think, is um, on page one, uh, 413, you shall not covet your fellow's house, you shall not covet your fellow's wife, Maid servant, my servant, ox, donkey, anything else that belongs to your fellow. Shall not covet. Well, it's very convenient. That's a word that nobody uses, so you know, could mean anything. What does covet mean? What are you not supposed to do here? Let me give an example. By the way, in, in Deuteronomy, when it's repeated, once the verb is shouldn't desire. That's what's supposed to happen. It's not Permissible, permissible to desire somebody else's house. I'm walking in Beverly Hills, and I see a house with grounds and everything else. I think, boy, that's real nice. I wonder if you'd be willing to sell it. Knock on the door. I'm admiring your house. Is it perhaps for sale? Would you consider $62 million? You know, just, you know, spare change I have it in my pocket. If you want a hundred, I'll make I'll make out a bank order. You know, uh, just tell me what you what you're interested. In. Am I violating a biblical commandment by making an offer on his house? That seems a little bit extreme. Can somebody put a for sale sign on his house and thereby attract attention so other people should look and think? Maybe I want his house. Are they putting a stumbling block in front of the blind by causing people to want his house? When people advertise what they're selling, anything, is that violating or causing a, a, a biblical violation? It sounds very extreme. So the commentators say here, that's not what's going on. I mean, there are, there are different commentators, but the one mainstream idea is this. You look at something that some, belongs to somebody else, and you think, I'd really like to have that. OK. Is he willing to sell it? Let's see. If he's willing to sell it, it's a reasonable price, I'll pay for it. No, thank you. It's been in my family for 16, you know, 16 generations. I'm not selling. Oh, really? You're not selling, hey? Well, let's see if I can't arrange something that might change your mind. And he finds out what business he's in and works to undermine it or works with other ways to drain his money to the point where he'll have to sell his house in order to stay afloat. That's not nice. So if he takes active measures to force him into selling it, then he violates this idea of not desiring. It's not just not desiring. It's desiring which leads to activity of actually stealing or leads to activity of trying to be able to get it against the other person's will. Then then it would be a, 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 a violation. But wanting something? No. That's not, a, that's not what the, the Torah prohibits here. Um, well, but what about then that desire, that desire to have it to the extent that it's motivating you, right? Should you at that point say, well, 
I'm in danger here. I'm going to actually take measures if I continue to want it. Maybe I shouldn't want it. Evan Ezra asked the famous question, can you control your desires? I mean, sometimes we mean control your desires, we don't act on them. Yes, that you can do, you have free will. But can you determine what it is you desire? And he says yes, and he uses an example which would be familiar to anyone who knows something about cognitive therapy. He says, imagine a king who's taking a drive in his ornate decorated carriage with his soldiers guarding the carriage, and he's traveling in the carriage with his, with his daughter, the princess, who's a beautiful woman, and she's young, and she's of marriageable age, and they're going through a very poor area. And a poor farmer looks at the horses and the soldiers and the carriage and the king and the princess. Will he desire to marry the princess? It's going to be inflamed with passion for marrying the princess? Says the Ebenezer, probably not, because he knows it's impossible. When you know something's impossible, that often dampens your... Your, your, your excitement for it, and, it, and it, um, you, you accept it. You come home at night, and you don't have your keys, and the door is locked. The door is locked. Whew, what am I going to do? How am I going to get into the house? Will you struggle to pull it open? Why not? You need to get into the house. Yeah, but you know you can't open it that way. You don't even have to fight down a desire to struggle, struggle to pull it open, because... You know it's hopeless. Knowing something is hopeless often, doesn't always work, but often means that you won't get excited about doing it or trying to do it. Now, here's a lesson which the Torah teaches, which you, know, you could meditate on and try to internalize. If there's a rule in the Torah and you're tempted to break it, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. It won't be worth it. Whatever you think you're getting, there'll be a time later when you'll think back and say, I wish I hadn't done that. It was a mistake. I was shooting myself in the foot. If you really took that seriously, that would cool your passion for it. It would reduce your, your, um, your, um, your, your d desire for doing it. There is a story of a person who had trouble with anger. He just didn't control his anger. And even his children became alienated. He lost his job. Even his wife became alienated. His whole life was going to pieces because he didn't control his anger. So he had a friend uh, who stayed out of his way most of the time. And the friend said to him, listen, it's obviously, it's obviously you have a problem. I'm Hasidic. I think you should go to the Rebbe and tell him about your problem. And uh, maybe he'll give you something to do to help you. So the guy said, yeah, I know. You're Hasidic. You believe in those rabbis. Thank you very much. You know, that's not part of my life. Uh, you know, it's for simple people like you, but I'm not interested. But it's got worse and worse. So finally, he said, oh, I have no, no hope the way I'm going. I have no other alternative. So he decided to go to the rabbi. So he went. And when he came back, the friend who recommended it said, no, you went to the rabbi? What did he say? Did he give you a solution? No, not at all. He told me something so stupid. I can't imagine why, 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 why I bothered to go. Really? What did he say? He said, it's okay to be angry. It's no problem. Don't worry about it. Just when you get angry, pretend you're not angry. Pretend. Just pretend you're not angry. Pretend I'm, I'm boiling inside. What do you mean? I got to get rid of the boiling. So he, he dismissed it as foolishness. But again, his life was continuing to go down the drain. So he said, okay, I have no alternative, I'll try. The next time somebody did something, and he would, would have yelled and cursed him and so on, he grits his teeth and says, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what he discovered? Something which psychologists had to learn in the 20th century, and that is that your feelings and your behavior are a feedback loop. When you have a feeling when you act it out, it doesn't relieve the pressure and the pressure goes away. No, it reinforces it. And then, and then the, the acting it out then reinforces the feeling and it's a feedback loop and it strengthens itself.
And when you want to stifle the feedback loop, you pick the point where you have control, and then that breaks the reinforcement of the loop. Well, you don't have direct control over your emotions, but you do have direct control over your actions. So it's going to be anger and, 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 vicious, and, and aggressive behavior, which then stimulates more anger, which is more aggressive behavior. If you can stop the aggressive behavior, you stop the feedback, and eventually the anger will dissipate. That's what the Rebbe was saying. Pretend you're not angry. Control the behavior. Act as if you're okay. And that will cool the passion of the anger and eventually be able to, to overcome it. So there are ways to deal with these kinds of, these kinds of passions. And that Evan Ezra is saying that even to control what you desire can, uh, can be something which you, which, you can, uh, which you can aspire to. And a large part of it is what cognitive therapy calls framing. Frame the situation you're in in, in a way in which you get the inspiration to treat it in the way that you should, the, the way that you should treat it. Um, I hope there are many fewer people smoking than, than used to be. But here's an example. A person is smoking and he's having trouble breathing. And he goes to the doctor and they do a workup on his lungs. Now you can imagine the doctor telling him your left lung is 60% shot. And if you keep doing what you're doing, in a few months we'll have to amputate it. You could tell him that in words. You could also show him an x-ray. <coughs> show him an x-ray of the lung and you see the lung and you see 60% is black. That could have a much bigger impression on him than just talking to him. Seeing the picture has a, it's not that you get new information, 60% and 60%. You can see with your eyes it's 60%. That's what the word said. No, but pre presenting it this way gives it a different frame. It's a different experience. It has a different, a different effect on, on, on what you have. So one of the things the Torah teaches us is that there are ways to frame the situation you're in which will change the emotions that you have. It'll change the emotions that you have. When, when I was in school, in high school, it was about... 233 years ago. Um, I had a friend who, he had a social problem. Um, people took advantage of him. They, he wasn't popular. And he told me he had a strategy for keeping his balance. When people used to criticize him or, or complain about him, he said, my first step is, let's see, is it true or not? What they're saying, maybe it's true. And maybe from this feedback, I'll learn something about myself and I'll improve myself. But if it isn't true, he said, then I hear what they say as dogs barking. If a dog barks at you, does that bother you? Does that upset you? Do you feel less because the dog is barking? Surely not. It's a dog barking. It's just a little sort of dehumanization. But he said, I just, I just hear dogs barking. It doesn't bother me. That's how he protected himself, by changing the, 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 the frame in which he put this, this, um, this, uh, this interaction. So what the Ebenezer is telling us in general terms is that if you have parts of your personality, parts of your psychology, which you would like to change, it is possible. Your psychology is malleable. We have mitzvos for psychology, mitzvos for emotions, and mitzvos for desires. We have mitzvahs that, 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 that address these things. And instead of feeling, but I'm hopeless because I just have these feelings, or I have this part of my psychology, the idea is to learn the strategies that exist for changing them, and that's the way you indirectly take responsibility for these aspects of your personality. Okay, I'm going to leave you with a question. Uh, I'm going to talk about this Hashem, on the night of Shavuos, uh, Tuesday night. I'll be here at 1.30. I'll, I'll, I'll raise a question for you. It's a good question. You can ask other people. If you go out for a meal on Shavuos, it's a good question to ask people. And you'll be here uh, uh, Tuesday night. I'll tell you the answer. It's a midrash, which you either have heard or you hear many times, that God offered the Torah to all the nations of the world. Not in place of us. We have to have it. In addition, in addition, if they had all said yes, the Torah would have been given to the whole human race simultaneously. That would have been the ideal. The Midrash records the responses of two of the world's nations. 
when it was offered to them, they refused it, and why they refused it. By the way, this offering took place because either the king or the high priest or some person in authority spoke to them, giving this message, just as Moses spoke to us two days before the revelation at Sinai, on the fourth day of Sivan, according to Rashi, where just he was talking to us and said, listen, the Creator has a Torah, and he's offering it to you. One said, what's written in it? What's written in this Torah? And the answer he got, they got was, don't steal. They said, don't steal? Really? Don't steal? <sighs> That's not realistic. Right? Don't steal? No. No, we can't have it. We, we can't have it. We, we can't take it. We can't live up to that. The other one said, asked what's written and said, don't kill. And they said, don't kill. We, we, we run an empire, you see. And <laughs> you can't run an empire without killing people. It's just, it's just not practical, you know. I mean, get somebody else. We can't do that. Those are the two uh, questions they asked, the answers they got, and the reasons why they rejected it. Now, here's the problem. Don't steal and don't kill are already in the Torah laws for non-Jews. They're already obligated in those laws. They're obligated as non-Jews in those laws. When they take the Torah, these are not new responsibilities that they will have. How then can these be the reason why they don't want to accept the Torah? If they ask what's in it, and it says keep Shabbos, it's, keep Shabbos, come on, that's my day for scuba diving. Leave me alone. I don't want that. Sure, because as a non-Jew, he doesn't have to keep Shabbos. And now he'll have to keep Shabbos. It'll be an extra responsibility. He doesn't want the extra responsibility. I can understand that. But he says, what's written in it? They said, X. Oh, I can't do that because I can't keep X. But you're responsible to keep X now. So if you take the Torah, you're not changing your responsibilities. How could that be your reason for not accepting the Torah? So think about that question. Ask people about that question. Tuesday night, when we get to the shir, I'll ask and see whether you came up with some answers, and then I'll tell you what, what I think the answer is. Rabbi, yeah. You said something that if they had accepted the Torah, then everybody would have gotten the Torah? Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, the other nations? That's right. Together with us. When, it's, when the Midrash says it was offered to them, each one of them, it doesn't mean in place of us. It doesn't mean he's looking for a nation that would accept it, and one nation would be enough. It means it was offered simultaneously to all the nations, and the ideal would have been that all the nations should have said yes, and then all of mankind would have been united in keeping the Torah. Just that they said no. Yeah. Like at what point in the, like in the timeline like, was this? Was this kind of like... So, like, a, like so, a, so I'm going to tell you, two days before the revelation. It was a, the, the revelation was on the 6th of Sivan, which is when, Wednesday, and it was on the 4th of Sivan. Two days before that. And we were offered it for a free, a free acceptance at the same day. That's when Moses said to us, God has this Torah, are you willing to take it? That's when we said, Nasa and Ishma. I heard that like we were forced to take it though because he like held the mountain over our heads. And was that was on the 6th of Siva. Oh. That was on the 6th of Siva. Both, both are true. If we have time, we'll talk about that on, on Tuesday night also. Okay. Sure.